Okay. Well, I see everyone's everyone's back from lunch, and uh, we're ready for round two here, which is which is in a sense the first special uh, specialized lecture in, in what might be the series, uh, the defense of the head. Um, for starts, of course, everything I said about armor design in general applies, um, and I'll, I'll I'll reiterate some of these points as I come to them. But if I if I don't, it's because I just forgot, you know, or or didn't want to take the time in, in this lecture figuring I covered enough in the previous. Um, the helmet, of course, is, ob is arguably the most important piece of armor. It covers your head. You know, what could be more important than that? You need your head, your brains are in it, like the, the Burma shave line, right? Um, and it's also sort of a focal point visually for the armor. You know, the first thing you look at when you see an armor is, is the helmet. You know, you, you just ev evaluate everything by the helmet at first glance. Now, maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm just like kidding myself because I, I always think that about every part I'm working on. You know, the, the sabatons are a focal point of the armor, but the helmet really is. Um, so, design principles. Next. They say same same thing applies. Um, so, what is a helmet? Next. So, what is a helmet? Well, a helmet's a shell. It goes on your head. What could be simpler than that? What does it do? Well, like, like armor in general, and of course I'm always talking plate armor because that's what I do. Uh, we're interposing a hard surface between, between man and the inevitable. Um, we've got to protect against three different sorts of things. We have to protect against laceration, penetration, and concussion. This, and this, uh, this, this picture beautifully shows all of these things happening to these poor fellows. Now, since the Machewski Bible is basically a, a religious cartoon, these fellows are having their heads split through their helmets, which, is, which seems pretty unlikely. But otherwise, the artist couldn't show the mayhem happening, right? Uh, but there's, you know, it has to withstand, as I say, laceration. And that's, that's laceration from a, a concerted blow from a sword like this, or even just an incidental blow. You know, you're minding your own business, and your buddy hits you with a backswing. Um, and that would, like, ruin your whole day, so you've got to have a helmet. Um, and I can't read my notes. Um, okay, so how does it do that? Well, there's a couple of, a couple of sort of mechanisms. First of all, it's, it's hard. It prevents the, the weapon from getting a bite. You know, the weapon will skid across the surface more readily than it'll skid across your scalp. You know, none of these weapons will bite a helmet as well as they'll bite your head. Um, the other thing that happens is it, is it, um, it spreads the, spreads the impact over a broader area. You know. Obviously, better to have the impact happen over several square inches than over the, the line that defines you know, the two inches of sword that's entering your skull. So that's, that's certainly, uh, certainly worthwhile. And then it does something else here that defies my... Uh... Oh, uh, the, the mass of the helmet is useful, too, because it, it dissipates some of the energy of the sword, the sword blow, some of the energy of the blow, whatever it be, um, through, through conservation of momentum. You know, the helmet's going to move under the blow. And, and that's going to suck a certain amount of energy out of it that, that would otherwise happen. Also, the, the helmet is going to deform under that blow, some, some plastically, some, some elastically. You know, it, might, it might dent a little and spring back out. It might dent a little and stay dented in. But all of that is energy which has been dissipated. And energy which is dissipated in your armor is energy which is not dissipated in your head. OK, so the most important part of a helmet, well, I mean, there's two important parts of the helmet. There's the shell, you know, and, and we've seen what that does. The other important part of the helmet is this, next, please, is the space you don't see. It's the, the thing you don't see. It's the space between the helmet and the head. Um, and this, this, space, this space is important. It defines the helmet, in a sense. If, if, you know, if it were not for the space, why, it would just be like a, a skull-shaped piece of, piece of steel. And it also provides a, uh, provides a, a space around the head for padding and, and, and some, other, you know, some other space in addition. Well, what's in that space? Next slide. This is where we're going to get weird here, guys. This is one of my concepts. I like to view the head as if it were surrounded by a zone. And I call that zone the inviolable region. Doesn't that sound powerful and, 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 and foreboding? This is the region into which the helmet must not intrude under any circumstances. And what I've got here is, is my idea about the inviolable region with two different neck treatments. Um, you notice that the spacing of this region is greater over the skull than it is over the neck. Because, of course, by the time you get to here, this is really neck. You know, your, your skull stops down at, the ba you know, down at the bottom of your earlobes, really. That's neck. So it, no it does not need as much space. 
you notice that the spacing gets bigger here over the brow, uh, not just because the brow is more protuberant, which of course it is to a greater or lesser degree on all of us, but because that's an area where if there's pressure, it makes your eyes squinty. You know, it, it's hard to see if, it's, if, if, if there's pressure, pressure there. Um, we have clearance over the nose, perhaps not so very much at the very tip of the nose because it's a little flexible. Um, we have some space under the chin so you can open your, open your mouth a little bit. You know, there's clearance over the mouth. Now the space gets funny down here at the neck. This, this internal line represents a theoretical helmet that sat right on your shoulders and had a, had a minimal amount of spacing. You know, you probably don't see anything exactly like it, but, if, but this is like the, the absolute minimum. This line here represents what if you had a helmet where the neck motion was more or less free. Not perfectly free, but free enough. And you see that this, this line here, if he tipped his head back, that line would come down and fall on this line. Does everybody see what I mean there? And, and likewise, if this line here, if he tipped his head down, the neck would collapse, right? This, this would, would come into compression because, of course, we're pivoting through the spinal column. This would collapse. Um, and this would fall down to the top of the chest. You notice how I've shown extra room here. This is room to accommodate the thyroid cartilage, the Adam's apple. And I've shown it up high like this because this ends up going down here as he tips his head down. Now, uh, this has some implications, ramifications, when you're designing a helmet that just barely covers the chin. Uh, or designing, let's say, Japanese armor, a mempole, where you've got a flange right there. And if, that's, if that flange happens here, it, as soon as you tip your head down, it jams you in the throat. Uh, but as I say, the, the sort of implications as you move your head. This edge here represents, you've got to view this as, as if it were in three dimensions, right? A, a representation of a three-dimensional thing. Uh, where that edge might be in a sort of a typical, a typical comfortable motion kind of a helmet. And here again, that edge, you know, maybe on some helmet that sat on your shoulders. Um, you see in this view, I've given him a pretty much, a pretty similar amount of space around his skull. I've skimped a little over the ears because the ears are compressible. You know, they need a little bit more space because they take up some volume, but they're largely compressible. So it kind of doesn't matter whether our ears stick close to the sides of our head like mine do or stick out like, like George W's. They're all compressible to about the same degree. And we need to, we need to accommodate them, but we don't need to get extravagant about it. Um, what else do I need to show about the inviolable zone? Does anybody have any quick questions about what I'm talking about here, or are we on the same page? OK. Um, let's go on to the next slide. So what's in this inviolable zone? Well, padding is a good, is a good start. And what I'm showing here is what areas are, are not, and might be padded. This area up here from the hat band line, this is, if you took a tape measure and like measured around your head in the sort of obvious place, or if you were like an old hippie and got a headband in a drawer somewhere at home, that's where it fits. You know, or if you wear a, you know, a fedora or something, you know, that's where that, that thing sits. Just above the ears, just above the brow, you know, right here at the wide point of the head. Everything from here up is almost invariably padded. You know, I'll say always, but there's never always and, and always never. It's almost invariably padded. And I've shown it here with an adjustable padding, as you, as you, you, know, as you might have. But that's just got to be padded. This area here, which I've shown in a slightly different quilting line, is an area which is sometimes or frequently padded. And you notice it's, you know, it covers the brow. Um, and I've sort of given it a little bit more space here to accommodate the brow. Um, covers the chin, never covers the, covers the face. This area is always, and I say always say, you know, never say always and always say never or whatever. But, you know, this area should be open. Uh, this area down here is frequently lined but seldom padded. I mean, if, if the helmet comes down all the way to here, there's probably some kind of thin, thin lining, but probably not padding per se. Front view, same kind of thing going on, front, front and back view, as you see, uh, showing the facial opening. And, uh, and again, you know, these various, these various areas. Um, so that's the padding. But what else, what else might, be, might be in that hat? Oh, oh padding. So what does the padding look like? Well, this is a pretty, a pretty typical padding. This is from a, a, a Maximilian uh, Armet in Glasgow. And we see the area that I was speaking of, you know, over the top of the head drawn together by this lace, which is all, all gone to hell. There's a little eyelet hole uh, sewn in there. There's the chin padding on the bever, which has been opened up so I can take the photograph, right? It's lying, we're, you know, the helmet's lying down with the chin open. 
Um, and here's the, uh, the articulating lame of the neck. And you see how big it is because it's close to the camera. Um, next, please. Is that a real Yeah, it's just a real deal. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a piece of that lining, and I'm, I'm, I'm pulling it back to show the underside. And you can see the quilting lines here on, on the inside, uh, you know, which are not as nice and even as, as the others because you know, nobody's supposed to see them. You notice it's not very thick. I mean, this damn thing would barely make a good pot holder. And, and that's pretty typical. You know, real helmets are, are padded with, you know, a quarter inch of padding or less. Just time and time again, it's what you see. You know, you, you look at these things, and, you know, you ask yourself the question, could I make a pot holder of this? And the answer is frequently, well, maybe not. Uh, so that, that doesn't account for a lot of our space. Next, please. Um, so what is in that space? Well, a lot of it is just air. Here I've, I've drawn a, um, an, Italian, an Italian armette, and I've shown the liner as the liner might be in such a helmet. You see that it's divided here where the tail is so the cheek pieces can open. And uh, you see that his chin has not got any padding, and that's typical of these armets. The padding just runs straight up to there. Um, and all this is just empty space in there. Um, and I've, I've drawn the padding coming forward here like this, because that's where the lining strip is. And this is, just, this is where the empty space is here over his brow, so it doesn't squint his eyes. Um, and we got empty space here, but we know what that's for, right? That's so he can tip his head back. Um, we got space here, but we see this space. That's gonna, when he tips his head, that's going to sit down in here just below his, his Adam's apple. And if we'd stop this a little higher, you know, like right here, we'd have to like be farther out so it didn't hit him in the Adam's apple when he tipped his head. A little bit of space here on the sides, not an awful lot. You know, this, this kind of helmet sort of smacks you upside the neck as soon as you tip your head. But look at all the space up in here. And later on when I show drawing full-size plans, the space is going to become very important because this is, this is this is what I term the style and function space. You know, the space that is not strictly needed to be a helmet, but to be that helmet. You know, the, the thing that makes it be the helmet in question. Um, so, maybe I better refer to my notes and see where I'm going. So what, um, next please. So what, what happens with this style and style space? I, I've taken the padding out here, but we're just gonna look at the space in general. A lot of it is taken up by the crest. So when we end up drawing this helmet around a full-size head, there's a lot of space here. But when we look in this view, there's not very much. It's a, you know, we have, you know, on a real helmet, we've got a half an inch, five-eighths of an inch of space or something at this close approach here. We have a fair amount of space here. And I'll get back to that in a bit. Um, the crest line takes up a lot of space. We have a lot of space in front of his face. So what are these spaces good for? Well, as we saw, this space is for movement. And this space is for movement. That space is partially for good looks. Um, another thing that happens here is we need space. We need space not only to accommodate the head in normal conditions, but we need the space to accommodate where the head will go when the helmet is rocked, rocked around on it. You know, if somebody wumps him upside the head with anything, his head is going to recede into that, into that pocket. And we need some place for that to happen. Um, the other thing that might happen is if, that, if this area, which is a likely strike zone, you know, is right out there in harm's way, a blow coming in sort of in an easy, obvious direction, travels right through the center of gravity of the helmet, it's likely to dent there. And we need some room for that to dent into. We need a crumple zone. So that's what some of that space is doing. That's what some of that crest line space is doing as well, is, is being a crumple zone. Any, any blow that falls diagonally across the head falls on the crest, and it crumples there. Um, the visor is also serving to some extent as crumple zone and to some extent to serve as a, as a watershed. It's the, you know, the, the, much, the much ballyhooed glancing surfaces. I, if I hear anything more gla glancing surfaces, I'm likely to scream. But, but in truth, this really is about glancing surfaces. This is about making the, the front of the face not flat. It's about making it be a shape so that a weapon hitting it won't stick. It'll skitter off to one way or another, you know, perhaps up until it hits this, this, uh, this hem and then skips out to the side. You know, or perhaps hits that hem and then just jumps to the next, you know, jumps straight across the eye slit and up, which is part of what, why that's sticking out so much, so that a blow will, will skip over the eyes. Um, the thing I had not mentioned before about one of the uses of the padding is to keep the, I, I'm going back to the use of the padding, keeping the, hel the, head, the helmet steady on the head. You know, oh, you know, I, pardon me, let me go back to padding in general. I, this is what I get for not following my notes. Um, keep, it keeps the, hel the helmet steady on the head. So you turn your head, the helmet goes with it. Um, it provides a, a cushioning medium between head and helmet. 
an elastic, an elastic medium, something where, you know, where, you know, so the, so the helmet skull cannot actually reach your head. It gets sort of increasingly difficult to press the helmet closer and closer to the head. I mean, this is just like how wall padding works. Um, and the other thing that, that the helmet padding does is it maintains a minimum spacing between head and helmet. You know, it's just always there so that you've got at least the thickness of the padding between, between your skull and the helmet skull. Um, sorry about that omission. Uh, let's, um, let's move on to the next, uh, next picture. Here's another thing that some of this pad, some of this space can do. Um, that helmet that I had before, you had to open it up to get it on and off your head. This, this is a, a helmet that you do on and do off just straight up and down. It's a, you know, it's a pull on. Uh, and you need this space to get your head in and out of it. You know, it just can't be any tighter than this and this guy still get his ears out. Now, this particular type of hat, this barbu, this is, this is like made from, drawing made from Wallace, uh, Wallace A78, which we, we happen to have a, a Radford copy of right here. Um, this particular hat, uh, like, like many barbute, are not padded <coughs> below this line of rivets. So it's not like he has, he has to pull his ears through padding down in this region. You know, it's, it's a pretty much clean, clean drop from there. So the helmet can be pretty, pretty tight at the bottom so long as he really can get his ears in and out of it. Uh, again, this space is about tipping your head back. This space is about tipping your head down. Uh, you notice how the nose just barely is, barely is confined within the helmet at all. Um, and as it happens, uh, where am I going to put my specs? If I, I don't have, there's no padding in here, but we put this on, and uh, you'll notice my nose is barely confined within the helmet at all. This is a, a Radford copy, and it's a very nice one. And, uh, you know, that's the real deal. It's a real size helmet, and I got what I think is a real size head, and you notice my nose is just barely covered. I might not have a real size nose, but whatever. But, you know, it's, it's, it's incidental to things. Um, the key to understanding... So we're working in two dimensions here, right? We've got two two two-dimensional views, a side view and a front view. The thing to understanding the human head is, the, is a top view. Let's go to the next one, please. Here's the same kind of, here's the same profile guy, but we've also got the pigeon's eye view of him there at the top. Um, like, think, think, think for, yeah. I have handouts. I forgot we had hand, handouts. Um, think for a minute about the shape um, I'm leaving the microphone if I do that, aren't I? Um, think for a minute about the shape of that human head. I've got some handouts, and I'm going to like hand them over to somebody to hand out. Sorry about this, guys. Yeah, okay, now we're under control. Um, what I'm going to hand out here, what, what he's going to hand out here, uh, is, is your, own, your own personal copy of this three-view Mr. Head guy. Um, this is a pretty typical human head. They vary a lot, right? But this is pretty typical. Some guys' heads are really wide. Some guys' heads are really long. Some are tall. But this is pretty average. You know, his forehead's a little, his forehead's a little high for, for mine, for example. Um, you know, but his head is wide, and my, you know, like mine is. You, in all, he's got sort of all the worst features of everybody's heads all in, all in one. His nose is kind of big. Um, eye placement is pretty typical. This is a thing that books on, on drawing and artist's anatomy, they argue about, or they, they, they don't argue, they differ in like where the eyes are placed. Some say, well, of course, the eyes are midway between the top of the skull and the chin. Draw a line halfway. Well, no, you don't see that exactly on people around you. Um, some will even say it's below the midline, or uh, uh, below the midline. Like these 19th century works that think that the human, the human body should be like this. Yeah, of course, you know, with this down, you know, they, they show like lines around the chin, even on skinny guys. Yeah, the eyes will be below center. For most people, the eyes happen just a little bit above the center. Like the center line is, is at the lower lid. It varies by about an eye width up and down normally. But, but that's a pretty, it's a pretty typical placement. Um, <clears throat> I expect that this thing is like a useful, a useful aid to thinking about armor design, and I'll show you a, a way you can use it a little bit later. Uh, but the top view is really the key view. It's not, it's not what you think, is it? You know, it's sort of oval, but then we've got, this, uh, we've got this business where the brow sticks out 
beyond the oval here. And the nose sticks out quite a distance, really. And the widest place in the head is just above the ears. So it's significantly back of center. There's the wide spot, just, just above the ear. Um, and you can see it here in this drawing. You know, that's, that's really just the wide place. So the helmet has to accommodate that wide space. It has to, it, and it has to accommodate, um, depending upon the type of helmet, it might have to accommodate the brow or not accommodate the brow. A bassinet, for example, stops before the brow. So it doesn't need to accommodate the brow space. Uh, that Armet that I showed earlier does a, it has a transition from a transition to the nose, so it, it has a very large space here at the at the brow to accommodate that. Um, it might be time for the ne yeah, next picture, please. This is this is this is a this is a good one. This is the inside of the of the uh, of the uh, the formerly Kerberg Avant, Avant uh, Barboot in Glasgow. Uh, and notice how head shaped this is. You've got your your hand out there. Imagine that head in this shape for a minute. And just, isn't that beautifully head shaped? It's just scrumptious. You know, it, it, it's 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 wide just where it has to be wide, and and you know, it's 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 not it's not so. It's it's a it's a generalized head shape is where I'm going. It's wide enough for guys with wide heads. It's long enough for guys with long heads. It's tall enough in the middle for guys who have a bump in the middle of their heads. The forehead's tall enough to clear guys with a bump in the forehead. It's just general. It fits everybody. I mean, it's the one size fits most shape. And that's, that's the thing that's, that's most, uh, most particularly beautiful about it. Um, let's go on to the next picture. There's the same helmet from the top. And remember what I was saying about about views from cameras before, we don't see anything at all of the tail of this helmet from this view, because we're, you know, we're, it, we're it's, a, it's obscured by this horizon of the helmet's occiput, and this is a, again a thing we, we're going to just keep coming back to about about interpreting pictures. From this picture, you'd think this thing was a skull cap with no with no tail, but of course it isn't. And again, you can see this, you know, this wideness, this width across the middle. I mean, this is a beautiful shape, or what? I, I just love this. Next picture, please. Um, here are two, two other hats in Glasgow. This one's a salad. This one is another barboot, which has sadly had its face mutilated sometime in its, in its working life. It had been cut open to be one of these very open-faced open -faced helmets. Um, notice how wide that is and how, how lens-shaped it is. Okay, this is a little bit more, more head-shaped, but even at that, we've got this big crest line in the back. His head is like not going not gonna to fill that. Um, let's go to the next picture where we superimposed Mr. Head. To the, to the best of our abilities. Um, and you see where the head fits in there. Now, in this helmet, in the previous helmet, the, the, the Avant of Barbut, the, the wide place was very nearly at the wide place of the skull. Here, for stylistic reasons, the wide place has been placed just forward of it, sort of you know, just at the forward edge of the ear. But it's a beautiful lens-shaped curve. We got a tremendous amount of style space here. We got all sorts of style and, and, and crumple zone space here. And here we have the transition to cover the nose. Now, this is just barely covering the nose. That's because the picture of the head is a projection, and the picture of the helmet is a perspective. You know, so we're having a parallax issue. This helmet is actually traveling away from, away from. You know, it's getting bigger as it goes down, but we can't see it from that view. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm not really just cheating him on nose space. You know, in a side view, he'd have ample nose space. From the top view, he does not. Same head, same scale. You know, the nose is sticking out. Because you know this is an open-faced, open-faced helmet. It's covering the brows, but it's not covering the nose. Here we got this beautiful transition up into the nose. Um, next picture, please. Same helmet, the same, the same salad, two different views. This is that parallax thing again. You know, here's something like that previous view, and you can just barely see the tail creeping out, and there's the, there's the, the, the lower edge of the sight. This we can't see anything at the lower edge of the sight, and we're starting to see the tail. You know, without any further information, you'd think these might be two different helmets. But of course, they're not. They're the same helmet, two different views. And this is one of the things that you can see that rust spot moves to a different location. Um, one of those things that you've got to got to think about all the time when you're when you're examining these pictures is how is the object actually photographed? Next, please. <coughs> same helmet from the back. Here we're above the above the line of the. Uh, you know, the camera is from like up here somewhere. Here the camera is below the line of the lining rivets. And see the difference it makes in the shape of the tail, the apparent shape of the tail. And now I've got to like step forward so I can actually see what the shape looks like from here. Um, or maybe I'll just like look at my, uh, look at my notes where I've got this. So I, I'm, ha I'm having trouble looking at it from the side. Um, 
No, oh, beautiful. Thank you. No, I got, I, got it, I got it right here. But you see how this one, where we're looking from below, the tail appears wider. That's because the tail is close to the camera. So it's just taking up more space in the, in the view. You know, it makes the tail look, look wider than this, than this view. This view, the tail looks a little bit, looks a little bit narrower. Um, next picture, please. Same helmet from the inside. I, I just got a couple of more pictures of this helmet because it's a beautiful helmet. But you can see it's really quite a long tail. Um, there's a little light coming through the sight there. It gives you, there's, a, there's a, the, the ledge of the sight. And there's like the furthest extent of the ledge of the sight. Um, here's a, a ratted out piece of lining strap. And there's a rivet that should have lining strap. And there's another one. So there's, you know, there's where the transition is from, from skirt to bowl. Next, please. And just for completeness sakes, this is what it looks like from the front. Beautiful hat. You can see from the crest that it's, it's very, late, very late 15th century. You know, it's, it's like the, the 80s or 90s you know, when we start getting this flattened look here. Splendid hat. Um, next picture. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. I, boy, focus would be good, wouldn't it? I, I screwed up the focus on this. Um, talk a little bit more about the idea of, of photography and the idea of, of projection versus perspective. These are both the same helmet in my shop. This is a prototype bassinet, uh, one of, one of a, a small family of prototype, or bassinet, pardon me, of, of barbute. One of a small family of prototype barbute sitting in my shop. I photographed the same helmet from different places. In the next three slides, on the left is a view from across the shop with a long lens. On the right is at arm's length with a normal lens. And you see the difference it makes. This, this looks more like our drawings are going to look. It's flatter. This edge is nearly horizontal. See, we, well, in both cases, we're, we're photographing at the level of the eye slits, so that those look about the same. But you see how this is curved in this view. And unless you appreciate where the camera is and how you're, in some sense, looking down at that edge because you're so close to it, you might, you might be tempted to think that edge was curved on the real thing. Well, you no, know, here's, uh, here's what Billy Radford did, and it's just pretty, it's pretty flat. He's, he's let the tail flip up a little bit in the back, but it's pretty flat. And, you know, and that's, that's the real deal. They're, they're really flat along the bottom um, and not curved very much at all. Next slide, please. Same thing. This is from across the shop very flat. This is from nearby. And you see what effect it's had on the bottom edge. This is more like what, what we might expect to see in our sketchbook. Um, and here, perspective has thrown this into, into, into a, a great long angle. And it's made it appear, appear sort of, um, it's made it appear narrow at the bottom because the helmet is canted forward at a, at a wearing angle, right? The helmet's sitting forward like this. So from the camera's point of view over here, this is a little farther away than this. So it's the camera sort of cheating the width here, making that. Whereas from across the shop, we see that it's, it's really wider at the bottom than it appears. Next slide, please. And the same thing from the back. Again, you know, from across the shop at a wearing angle and from nearby at the same angle. And from nearby, you see this line has gone flat because we're, we're no longer able to see up under the helmet at all because we're looking down at that edge. Um, and again, we get the, the width distortion, but this way, this, in this picture, it goes the opposite way. It appears bigger in the, in the near, in a close-up picture, because relatively speaking, you know, if the camera is here, this, this edge, this lower edge is, is closer to the camera than it, than it would be if it was, because it's sitting like this, right? It's closer to the camera than, than it would be if it was, the camera's on the other side. Does that make sense? So that's a distortion. You know, a parallax error about the position of the camera. And again, this is about this part where you've got to like imagine your eye where the camera was. Uh, next picture. Another problem. This is, this is a prototype bassinet sitting in the shop. And again, no focus that you'd notice. I, 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 don't, I don't see this on the screen in my little camera, right? But I see I focused it quite badly. Um, these are taken from about the same distance but three different angles. This one's taken from low down. This one's taken from in the middle, and this one's taken from high up, looking well, not high up, but a little higher than the eyes looking down. And you see the difference it makes. You know, here the the bottom appears quite wide, the bottom of the facial is quite wide. The point appears quite low and rounded. In this picture, the point is quite high and, and pointed. The bottom of the facial appears kind of narrow, and this is the kind of distortion that you got to understand when you're working from pictures. You know, this is more like the view that you see in, a, uh, in an English brass, where it seems to be all helmet and no face. Because you know, 
The guy's, the guy's in prayer. His head is down like this a little bit, and you're seeing that helmet just as tall as it possibly could be. You know, this is the helmet. This is the view you might see of that helmet if your opponent is taller than you. <laughs> that's, that's always what I had. Uh, next, please. Same thing from the back. Um, and again, the same sorts of, of distortion. In, in this one taken from, from down low, the bottom seems quite wide. In this one taken from, from, from up a little higher, the bottom seems kind of narrow. Um, and, and, and again, in between, in between. And you see also what, what effect it has on, on the look of the bottom edge. You know, here we see it this way. Here we see it nearly flat. There we see it curved the other way. Same helmet, three pictures, three views. Um, and this is where I've changed something. Oh, oh, this is, this, is, this is techniques time. Now we're going to talk about some techniques. And the first thing I want to do, can we break out the overhead projector pretty quick? Well, let me tell you what we're going to do with the, with the, the transparency with the heads. This is, this is my standard uh, normal head profile at several different, several different sizes. And if you multiply by that number on your calculator, you know, any, that'll tell you like how many percent to normal or how many percent of normal. You know, this top guy is 19.5% of normal size. Um, and what we're going to do when we get the overhead projector, which I forgot to mention earlier, is we're going to lay these things over pictures from the Wallace Collection catalogs. You've all got the Wallace Collection catalogs, right? Maybe how many no, people? I got the last 20 copies in the world, so give me a call. Really? You do? I do. Hmm. Talk to that man. Um, how many people do have the Wallace Collection catalogs? I mean, pretty much most, most, most of you guys have got Wallace Collection, and he's got enough that he could sell them to the rest of you. Um, the Wallace Collection catalog, the pictures of, of helmets in the back, are pretty good pictures in terms of being, of being horizontal, you know, of being... You know, the, the camera is, is pretty much at, at eye slit level. It's not looking down at the helmet. It's not looking up at the helmet. So these pictures lend themselves well to, to this, this paper doll overlay thing that we're going to play with. I didn't count on the part where I like, didn't mention the uh, overhead, so now I'm, I'm, I've, I've lost my, my role here. Um, but when we get the overhead, I'm going to, I'm going to lay some, some pictures from the Wallace Collection down in there, show you how to do this, and send you guys away with homework. And you know, the homework is, you know, obtain a copy of the textbook from, and, uh, Simon from Simon Legree, and, uh, and, and, and play with these overlays until you understand how the human head is supposed to fit in any of these helmets, which are, which are orthogonal enough to the camera that you can tell what's going on. You know, which is not everything in the catalog, but, but probably better than half of them are, are photographed well enough that you can lay the, lay the paper doll straight on and, and everything, everything works out okay. Um, the other thing I'm going to show you is with the, with the, the three view guy, um, and this is more homework, what I want to do is send you away with the three view guy, and the exercise there is to sketch helmets at, you know, what turns out to be one, one quarter scale. Um, over top of this in three views, uh, just to like, you know, just for the joy of it, right? Just to sketch helmets. Um, on, sketching them on tissue paper uh, so that you can like move them around and, and, and you know, keep using, the same, uh, keep using the same thing over and over again. Uh, I'm going to take questions now while we're looking for, uh, while we're looking for that, yes? Come on. on the, uh, yeah. Palette that was back a couple, maybe yeah. the original. Mm -hmm. um, it was appeared to be pretty asymmetrical from side to side. Yeah. Is this an artifact yeah. of construction, or is that um, photography? Part of it is an artifact of photography, but I think part of it's an artifact of construction too. These things, maybe the front view might be more revealing. Um, no, it's not really straight enough. On. Well, you know, you can. It kind of looks like it isn't. I, I mean, it's a lot to expect the real ones to be symmetrical. You know, they don't. The customer base does not demand symmetry of the of the Renaissance craftsman, and he doesn't get it mostly. You know, it's symmetrical enough, and you see that there's enough extra room in there that it just kind of doesn't matter. Um, but as far as I can tell, a certain amount of asymmetry is is just to be expected in in real pieces. You know, we we strive modernly very hard to to make our pieces perfectly symmetrical, but 
to a large extent, we're, we're wasting our time. You know, we should learn to be sloppy in the correct, in the correct ways and the correct amounts and educate our customers to accept it. Actually, symmetry is one of the hallmarks of detecting a fake. If they're really symmetrical, they're generally fake. If the spacing between rivets is some even number. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if it's anything even. It's it's probably symmetrical enough. It's close, but yeah. It's not perfect. And we often see it most in the the curvy area. Yeah. The other place where you where you see asymmetry a lot is in the mounting of the visor, because if you if you if you mount the visor pivots, you know one of them say a quarter of an inch, which isn't very much higher than the other. When you lift the visor, it's going to it's going to cant drunkenly over to one side, and that didn't seem to bother our ancestors. You know, the modern eye, like, is aghast to see it. But perfectly respectable helmets with perfectly respectable visors can over to one side when they lift them. Yeah, I, I, I never make mine that way. I try not. Okay. So the way we use this is let's, we're, what we're, this is an exercise about understanding helmets, right? So let's take this helmet <coughs> right here. And we see that the eye slits are pretty horizontal. And that's a pretty good. Up a little bit. Oops, I'm sorry. The eye slits. Yeah, I guess we've got to suffer to have a little keystone there and, and let it come yeah. up. Okay. Okay. Um, let's, take, let's take this one. This is every, one of everybody's favorites, right? Um, we see the eye slits are pretty horizontal, and that means that it's photographed from pretty straight onto the side. Again, the, uh, the neck is kind of horizontal and kind of flat, and that means that the camera is far enough away that we don't get an awful lot of parallax. So this is a pretty good, a pretty good one to start with. And we look at this, and, well, you know, that's... If he can see out of that helmet, his head's too high, so that's not good. Well, let's, let's go to a smaller one here, and uh, yeah, that's that's not looking too bad. See, we got we got to get him so he can look out the helmet, but that looks a little bit that looks a little big on him. Um, actually, let's turn this over this way so I can read the numbers. Um, that looks pretty good right there. This is 16.5. Is it set? Yeah, you guys can read it. You know, 16.5. So you could, you could multiply this helmet by whatever factor is the reciprocal of 16.5, I guess, if you can do math. Uh, I would have to, like, work it out until I thought it through carefully. But, but people who can do math can do this. Uh, but you'd figure out a conversion factor. And what I, what I typically do is when I figured out a conversion factor for a picture in, in one of my books, I just jot it down in pencil next to the picture. So next time I look at it, I know I multiply by 3.6 to get something that's about life size. So with many of the helmets in here, you can do the same business. Just keep shifting around until you find one that looks good. And, you know, there's got to be neck room. We have to, he's got to be able to see out the eye slits. The eye slits should be, should be closing in on horizontal. Sometimes they're a little bit tipped up. Sometimes they're a little bit tipped down. But they should be closing in on horizontal. And it should respect the, uh, the inviolable space around his head under all circumstances. Here's one where the eye slits tip down. This is a sort of a funny, a funny looking hat, but that's that's approximately the right size guy to fit in there. Maybe a little bit bigger. This is kind of like being at the eye doctor, you know, which is better, this one or this one, this one or that one. Um, and you can do this with, uh, as I say, any of the helmets that are that are pretty pretty orthogonal to the to the to the camera. Uh, let's see, something a little bigger, no smaller. You know, that's not a that's not a bad fit. You can see under there, you know, looks all right. Yeah. Do you see which one I'm doing? I'm doing the this 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 uh, this salad here. Um, maybe. Uh, well, you see what I mean, yes. So take these home and play with them. They're they're a lot of good fun, um, and you can do it with. Uh, this this is a good one because it's got a nose. You know, if, if his nose doesn't line up in the nose place, well, it can't be right. bigger. But you, you get the idea. And as I say, sometimes the isolates slant up a little, sometimes the isolates slant down a little, but they never slant very much. And if, if it, 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 um, you can, you find that different sorts of helmets have different typical isolate slants. Um, this kind of thing here with a field visor and a, and a perforated area above this watershed, these eyes typically slant down at the corners. 
and you just like expect that when you find when you find a a, a head size that's that they can look out, well, eh, he's too uh, he's too big, um, that it's going to slant down. By contrast, something which has more like a tilting shaped visor like this one uh, is typically kind of kind of downcast in the middle, the, which is to say the eyes the eyes tend to go up at the corners. And why that is, I'm you know I'm not exactly sure. Whoops. But you, but you do find it as a kind of a general theme. I mean, I guess it must be that when you're jousting, trouble comes from slightly below your eyes at more or less this angle, right? You know, you can afford to have them tip down to to an angle which is which is commensurate with the angle that your that your opponent's lance is going up from from his armpit, I suppose. So take those home and play with them. Let me show you another another thing which also happens. And that's. Uh, So here's Mr. Mr. Three View, and what we can do here is we can let's say this was a piece of tissue paper, and let's say that I had my marking pen in my pocket. Mm -hmm. We could take our piece of tissue paper, and we could begin by marking a couple of locations. It's not gonna. Marking a couple of look. Anybody got a sharpie? <laughs> Anybody got any duct tape? Who's got a knife? Well, I may forego this. I may forego this, but you understand what I'm saying. Mark, mark some of these. We have a lost set of keys at the reception desk. Anyone who has lost their car keys, please come to the front reception desk. Thank you. They lost a sharpie. Yeah, they lost a sharpie. <laughs> Take your piece of tissue paper. Mark a couple of these crosshairs down so you can replace it in the same place later, and just sketch your helmets over the, over the top, right? And what, whatever the height is in this view, it should be the height in this view, right? And you know the eyes in this view end up lining up with the eyes in that view. Everything ought to line up. Um, now, as I was saying before, the third view is really the key to understanding a helmet. You could have a helmet which satisfied both the front and side views, but the top view was ridiculous, and it wouldn't be a helmet. Let's take this example. You know, beautiful salad from the front and the side, but from the top it's a box and it looks like an Art Deco toaster. You know? <laughs> so this is never going to be a helmet. This can't be a helmet. And, and this is about reconciling these three views. Um, and you see what I've done here? I've like cast these lines up to a diagonal and then cast them over. You can also put your compass at this point here and take this line from this Take, you know, cast, cast this line from here to here, from, you know, from, from, well, from this line to that line. But you, you've all seen this in mechanical drawing classes, right? No. no. Uh, there, there, there's a trick you can do with a compass, and it's about like casting it from that point. Here's another example of a helmet which, which doesn't make it, although it satisfies both of these side and front views. And although it's strangely cool, it can't be a helmet because your head doesn't fit in there. But again, you see that the third view is the thing that tells the that tells the tale. Um, what do we think of that one? Not quite, though. It's too round in the front. This is this is a helmet we've all made before. It's too round in the back too. We've all made this helmet, right? It's just too damned round. You know, it looks okay from this view. It looks okay from that view. From the top down, from the pigeon the pigeon view, it just doesn't fly. There's too much. There's too much roundness here. You know, it's not bad, but it just isn't right. The real deal You know, again the same the same from these two views, but you look down from the top and ah, there it is. You know, it covers his nose. We got a nice crest line in the back. We don't have an awful lot of, you know, there's not a lot of roundness here. It's sharp. We got a good watershed. Um, oh, where's the Excuse me. That's that's not the one that has a uh, that has a, has a uh, there we go. Here's the one I meant to lay down. Um, same three views. The fourth view, the perspective view. You see how how much sharper that is. You know how much sharper it is here in the forehead. Um, and of course, we can do this with any with any hat we want to. And I've got a couple of a couple of other examples. You know, there's a uh, there's a bassinet sitting at its more or less typical. Uh, Typical angle, 
and uh, you know the eyes are nearly horizontal, and, and from the top view, you know we got this sort of spy versus spy look. <laughs> and I've got uh, maybe that's all the helmets I brought. Yeah, you know that is. I thought I had a great helm, but I don't. Okay, so we're going to move away from the overhead projector, start collection catalogs, and uh, use that three view thing. Uh, in, in, in your primary, you know, your preliminary sketches of helmets but as you begin. Feel free to photocopy that stuff for your own use. I don't want to see it published, though, okay? Like, don't put it on your web pages, you know. Those, those heads are my heads. You know, use them, use, them, use them for good and not for evil, and don't publish them. Um, let's move on to the next slide, and I can see where, see if I can figure out where I am. We're in, we're in techniques now, and now we're going to come down to the same kind of thing I was talking about in the previous lecture, the, the nuts and bolts of measuring measuring the wearer and so forth. Next, next slide. Next slide. Okay, here's my, uh, here's my head tracing apparatus. This is a doorway. There's a piece of quarter-inch plywood there with a bunch of holes, a couple of drywall screws in the, uh, in the door frame, and a couple of notches cut out, one for a left shoulder and one for the, uh, one for the upper back, and some butcher paper taped down. Next, next, please. And there's, uh, there's somebody standing to have his picture drawn. He's got his left shoulder stuck in the notch there. I've adjusted this height so that, let's see, I think I can actually see the, uh, the drywall screw in the, right there, and there should be a corresponding one over here somewhere. These are at one inch, one inch spacings as it happens. You know, do whatever you wash, wish. There you can see the perpendiculator. I'm going around the curve of his nose. I'm holding his head steady so nothing moves. I've encouraged him to hold his head as naturally as possible. Because when we design a helmet for someone specifically, we want it to be comfortable enough with their head carriage. Some people stand like they've got a ramrod up their backs. Other people stand with their heads like geese. Most people are somewhere in between. But you, he's got to be able to wear the hat. You know, however it is he's comfortable holding his head, it's got to be possible to hold his head that way in, in the helmet. Next, please. Same thing from the, from the, the front view. Um, you see we've got his back and shoulders into that cutout. And... I've encouraged him to stand as much as possible in the same way. So if everything works out correctly, the heights should be the same from one to the other. Okay, again? And we're going to make sure that everything came out okay by, by measuring his head at the, the wide spot just above his ears. Next, please. And transferring that to the drawing. If anything's wrong, we're going to correct it. You know, if, if, if the sketch turned out to be strangely different than, than that width, then something went wrong and it's time to retrace to make sure. Next slide, please. Same thing with the length, just above the brow ridge to the occiput. Next, please. We put that there. And see where I've like drawn a line here? This is because I'm so damn short and he's tall, and I just like made a sketch where his eyes are, but I put them too high, and I'll fix that in the next one. Next, please. I've, I've, I've rectified that. This is a parallax error where the, where the short armor has trouble dealing with tall, uh, the tall wearer. Um, but there we are, and there's where his eyes are, and you know his eyes are going to line up straight across this view. So we can take this, transfer it to our full-size notebooks, and just start. And having like made our sketches on our little three view, so we were we got the helmet in our heads. We're now going to like make that helmet be full size. Next, please. I'm going to walk through an exercise here using one of our favorite helmets, Kerberg 13. Let's pretend for a minute we're going to we're going to make Kerberg 13. So the first thing we're going to do is gather up all the pictures. Oops. We're going to gather up all the pictures we can. Next, please. And, you know, we've, we've, you've seen some of these pictures before. Many of us have seen all these pictures before. Next, please. And this is the one from the Kerberg catalog. This is the picture of it from the 16th century. Next, please. And I'm going to take this view, because this is a very square-on view. See, we can see straight through the eye slits. We know that it's, the camera is, is right here somewhere, although arm's length away, no doubt. Although this is pretty flat, so it may be more than arm's length away. These are, you know, Herr Tropp was a pretty good photographer. His, his pictures are pretty good. Um, so we made a tracing, and we know the dimensions, as I said from the previous, the previous lecture, 28 centimeters here, 28 centimeters around the curve. But, but there's a problem. Go to the next, please. Oh, we have 28 centimeters around there. Here's a little ruler. These rulers are, you know, are useful. It seems kind of hokey, but, but I, like to, I like to make them up. I usually make them up in, uh, in cardboard, but this photographed better. Next, please. So who can tell me what the problem is with this hat? What's wrong with this hat? Come on, guys. What's wrong with this hat? The light <laughs> yeah, what's, what's, why, doesn't this, why isn't this closed down right? What's wrong here? 
Wh why is this hinge pivot atypical? Look at this. It's cheesy. You know, it only looks like one layer of steel. It's a funny shape. Usually these things are symmetrical top to bottom, but this is like some kind of weird. Uh, this looks sloppy. Uh, what, what's happening here? Next slide. Well, look at that. That's the helmet skull, isn't it? He can't see out of that, can he? D didn't you guys ever notice this before? Who, who's noticed this before? I'm not saying, no, nothing here is a fake. It may be that it, uh, well, go back a slide, or two slides. Oh, there we go. Oh, no, right there. See, we can't close it anymore. That's, that's flush against that edge. We can't force that visor down anymore. Yeah. It, either, this, either these two pieces are associated, I use that as a technical term, um, or, or it's the visor that really belongs, but somebody's remounted it and done badly. Forward a couple? Well, yeah, sure. Right here? Yeah. It is a hole. I don't know what's up with that. I don't think there's a corresponding one on the other side. It's, no, it can't be a spring pin hole, but you know, there's a, there's a couple of helmets in Vienna which have two holes here and a hole right here as if maybe they had a strap, a couple of bassinets, uh, the ones with the big square, square, uh, square jowly visors and the vertical slits. Or the one has vertical slits, the other has horizontal slits. Um, forward again, please. Again. So whatever, whatever happened, it happened as, as early as the as early as the, as the late 16th century when this picture was painted. You know, that's clearly the same visor. And uh, I can almost make myself believe it's the same funny thing going on here. It's not closing, but that's tight. So these, these items seem like they may perhaps been associated since the 16th century. Perhaps they were stuck together when the guy painted that this is like the picture of the family tree. Here's the founder of the, the, founder of the family like lying dead in the tree bursting forth from his chest. Uh, and, and this is supposedly his helmet, although it's, it's too late to be his helmet, really. So maybe these were associated for the, for the artist to make this picture showing the family tree. Who knows? One way or another, if we're going to make this helmet, we've got to do something different about it. Next, please. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do, having decided that that's about how far down the skull goes, and that's consistent with our pictures looking in the eye slit, we're going to just like change this to a more normal pivot. Next. And we're going to dimension these drawings. You know, I've cast some lines through some relevant points, like from this point to that point, and I'm going to measure that. And I've got a line from here through the pivot, and I'm going to, uh, like, use a compass to establish, like, this, like, the distance from this to this, so I can transfer this. You could do it on a photocopier if you had a big photocopier. You could do it, with, like, on a square grid, whatever, whatever pleased you, but just to get it up to full size. Next, please. So here we are at full size. Uh, and I've done it on, on tissue paper so I can overlay it over. Next, please. Oh, and the visor, ditto with the visor. Next, please. So we're going to lay it over our, the full-size head. This is my standard head size. And we see it's a pretty tight approach. You know, we're a little close here, even, even for a real hat. And you see that I've got this just over the brow ridge, uh, which is typical of a bassinet. And this edge is about where it belongs. Um, the part where this is is pretty shallow here not covering much of his jaw. This is kind of typical as far as I can tell. Um, so what I did is I, next please, I fudged a little bit, a little bit more room. And maybe parallax would account for it, and maybe we're just going to size it up just to scooch. But I don't feel too bad about scooching in a quarter inch here and a quarter inch there to make it, to make it fit in a reasonable way. You know, I, I don't think I've offended against the design very much. Next please. And the same thing with the visor. We got everything in place over Mr. Head. Uh, again, this is in a perfectly reasonable place. This distance, the space is going to get used up pretty quick when he tips his head back. Um, this coverage is not very great, but there is coverage, and this is pretty typical as far as I can tell. This distance is not very great, but again, that's typical as far as I can tell. You know, I think it's fitting him pretty much like a like a bassinet should. And as we see, sorry about shining the light over there, guys. Um, you know, he can see straight out the eyes. The eyes are are pretty level. Next. Oh, um, oh, right there. Um, no, it's okay. Um, this is how far I had to move the pivot. And you notice that that space is actually covered by where the current pivots are, the current hinge pins. It would be interesting to lift the visor and see whether there's a hole there. Just a thought. Um, but here I've lifted the visor on the drawing to make sure that everything still works. 
because I've moved the pivots forward, which would cramp the amount of the amount of movement on the visor. But we see that the visor lifts enough that he has a clear view underneath it. So everything's hunky dinky. You know, we can feel reasonably good about this reconstruction. Next, please. Uh, and there's the completed the completed drawing, sort of ready to go if we're going to if we're going to build this hat. Um, next, please. Like I was saying about what, what's typical, this is, a, this is a, a composite overlay. I've done the same technique, the scaling up technique, on six different bassinets and, and, and about as many visors um, and laid them all on top of the same head profile. And you see, you, you see the results are pretty similar all the way around, aren't they? You know, this is just like time and time again when you scale up a bassinet to dimensions in a book or to a likely, a likely, a likely starting point, this is what you get. This is the odd man out. See that one? That's the only one that gives you like SCA style coverage. This is the uh, the so-called Joan of Arc bassinet at the at the uh, at the Met. Um, so if it is a real bassinet, um, it was for somebody with a with a tall head and a long neck. You know, it's just it's just a taller bassinet than normal. You know, it's 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 for it's for someone with a taller head. Um, you know, so uh, so much for the idea that it really did belong to Joan because like she was never said to be tall. Uh, next, please. Here's a different project. This is a prototype bassinet, but I'm, I'm going to like, you know, we'll, we'll just like work with this for a minute. Um, different project. I'm taking it out of the sketchbook. I'm putting a tissue paper overlays and tracing. Next, please. And I'm making up cardboard templates to match that. Although I've blunted the tips, these, these are the profiles that I expect will fit inside the helmet. Next, please. So here I, I've got this helmet partially constructed. Well, it's actually pretty far along. Um, I should have checked this sooner, but this is a prototype, and I intend to like move on with my life. Um, but you see how this is curving here. I've run, I've run the, the grain of the cardboard this way, by the way, so it'll it'll curve without kinking. You all know the cardboard's got a grain, right? You, you got to obey the grain of the cardboard, or your templates get all kinky. Um, but I've got the grain going this way so that this will flex, uh, and we see that it's tight here and here. Next, please. And, whoa. I've, I've marked the places that are tight. I've marked where it falls short. That's a short, not shit, although it might. Um, there's where it's loose. That's where it's tight. Next, please. You know, see, it really does say short, although no one can read my writing. Um, next. And tight there, starting to get loose there. Next. And from this view, which is badly out of focus, we can see the facial is not too far off. This needs to recede deeper into the helmet, which would take care of some of this. But you know, in general, this line is not bad. All, all three of these edges line up pretty well. That's not too far off that way. Um, next, please. Next view, same, same thing. It's a little tight here, a little loose there, a little tight up here. If I was doing this for real and not as a, as a didactic uh, experiment, you know, didactic procedure, I, I would do, this, I would do this, this notation in pencil and erase it between, between iterations. But... You couldn't read it if well, you, nobody can read it because I wrote it anyway. But but you couldn't see it. It wouldn't photograph well in pencil, so I've written it here in Sharpie. Next, please. And again, you know, there's a tight area. You can see it's in contact right there. It's out of contact there. It's in contact there. So those are places where I need to change this helmet or change its successor to match my my original sketches. And but this project has been languishing. I just brought it brought it back out to photograph it for this. Uh, next, please. So, in addition to checking it with the, with the templates, we're also going to do that visual check that I, that I was speaking about in the previous lecture, which is the put your eye where the camera was technique. Um, again, it's a, it's, a very, it's a very powerful technique um, and part of the, the, the process of honest evaluation. Uh, when you go to check against one of these things, you can't like lie to yourself about it. You know, you look at it, is it, is it, you know, is it is or is it ain't really the right shape? So what I'm trying to do here is get something like the outline of, of, of A78, which Bradford has captured very nicely. Um, and you know, here I've got my specimen set up. This is the same one I photographed earlier. Um, and uh, my book in hand, Wallace Collection Catalog. Next, please. And here's a photograph from that eye view. Now, ignore the eyes for a minute, because I wasn't trying to copy that. Uh, but this is the, the line I'm looking for. And it's not too bad. Um, I'm a little weak down here in the tail, or the flip, as my, uh, my sister-in-law, who's a beautician, calls it. You know, she thinks that's the, the flip on the helmet, um, I guess. So it's a little weak in the flip, uh, but otherwise it's not a bad shape. Um, as I say, the, the, 
the eyes are, are different. I wasn't trying to do these eyes. Uh, the other place where we've got a difference is right here. This line right here, mine is coming in more. That means that my helmet is too round right in here. You know, in, when, when viewed this way, it's not flat enough across the cheeks. It's too curved. Uh, like I say, you know, honest appraisal. You know, you look at it, where is it wrong? Not is it wrong, but where is it wrong? Because it is wrong. Of course it's wrong. Next, please. Same thing matched against a, uh, a helmet in Laking, said to be in a private collection in Munich. Um, and I was going for eyes more like this. But you see, I've, I've fallen, fallen badly short of what I, what I wanted. These eyes are too wide. You know, you can see it in this view. You can see it in this view. Um, the profile, again, doesn't match too badly. You know, it's, 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 it's not bad. It's not bad. Again, we might have the idea that this, this curvature isn't quite what it should be, but it's, it's, not, it's not awful bad. Um, subsequent prototypes, I've, I've, I've changed the eyes on that. But, you know, you gotta, be, you gotta be honest and harsh with yourself. Does it look like the picture or does it not look like the picture? Or more to the point, where does it not look like the picture? Next, please. Um, so there's always this, the part about, like, trying it on. You know, this is, again, like I showed before, you know, you've got to have fittings with your customer as well. In between fittings with the customers, you know, you put it on your head. But you've got to know your head shape, and head shapes vary a lot. You, you can get a lot out of trying a helmet on, even for somebody whose head is very different than your own, if you know your head shape. You know, I know my head. I've got no forehead. I've got a forehead like a Neanderthal or something. Well, that's not true. I don't have the brow ridge. Um, I have, a very, I have a, very, a, very, uh, a very round forehead. My head is very wide. My head is six and uh, it's like six and a half or six and five eighths. I mean, it's just astonishingly wide. So, in a sense, my I, I, I like did measurements and and, uh, and dimensions of a, of a couple dozen guys' heads about 20 years ago and wrote them down. And I'm tie for the record out of that two dozen two dozen people sample for width of head. Um, I'm also very nearly very nearly the shortest front to back head that I measured on an adult male. Um, so my head is round like Charlie Brown's. The difference between the width and the length of my head is less than an inch. I think I'm seven eighths of an inch off. The the, the maximum I, I I measured was was two and and almost a half or two and about a half out of out of round. You know, difference between between this and that. But an average helmet, a real helmet designed to fit the average head, will be wide enough to fit this wide noggin, you know, and and long enough to fit yours. You know, it should fit both of our heads equally well, because we're just like in the normal range of adult male heads. If your helmet doesn't do that, it's not a helmet somehow. So know what shape your helmet is. So I, you see how much room I've got here in the, in the forehead? That, that's what I was, what I was trying to do, is to make a, an average style helmet. I wanted a helmet which was going to be a good fit on me side to side and too loose front to back. And that's what, that's what I expect to see when it's on my head. Um, I need another eighth of an inch of padding or something to jack that up a little higher. It's covering my eyebrow a little bit too much from this view. It should really be just a scooch higher. Um, and that covers what I, uh, what I intended to do here. So I, ho I hope to like, take some questions. No, but I'm marking them in the flat. Yeah, those 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 pieces were were weldments. Those helmets were weldments out of out of three pieces, the, the barbute, um, and also the bassinet for that matter is a weldment in three pieces. Um, but I've I've marked I've marked the holes on the template. It, it's intended as a production yeah. as a production piece, and I want them. I don't want to have to mess around with it. I want to be able to just like mark them in the flat and have the holes still be still be findable when I'm done hammering it, and and then deepen them and drill them. So yeah, it's, it does seem a little premature to be putting the putting the holes in, although although that that barboot was 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 heart, was heat treated already. Yeah. You know, it said it said 650 written on the side. That's to remind me like what I tempered it at. Yeah. I've taken to like jotting it. You know, if, if anything gets suspended at any time during heat treatment, I jot it down on the helmet, or on the, you know on whatever the piece is. Another question. Um, when you yeah. talk about like, you're doing. Uh, Well, it's, those are intended to be production helmets, prototypes for production helmets. Do you test pieces on when you're doing custom orders as well? Do I do test pieces? Well, like, oh, I'm going to do, do this, and I'm not sure how it's going to go, so then I just try and do one and never really intend it to go to customer, but intend it to be the, the test to make sure the technique is going where you want it to go, or, or 
Well, I, 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 never, I never do that intentionally, but if a piece is just never going to be right, well, then you just set it aside and start again. You know, and it, bec it becomes a test piece, even though it didn't, it didn't necessarily start as a test piece. I mean, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do test pieces in the sense of, of, you know, decorative tests and so forth on scraps, but, but for the most part, if I'm, if I'm making a helmet, I, I hope that's the helmet that I'm going to, that I'm going to sell. You know, and if it doesn't happen to be, then you know, I, I hope that it'll become some other helmet someday, and 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 the experience gained will help me make the helmet I want to make. Does that does that answer your question? Is that yeah? Yeah. In historic times, did they when they used to make up all the helmets for for all the armies and stuff? Did they have certain forms that you know that they used as a? Well, that, that's a very interesting question. I was talking with Pierre Turjanian from from Philadelphia recently. And he, he's a document guy. He reads documents, and he's found a, evidence of a contract for some armors um, who are making a bunch of armors, and the, and the van braces have to match a, a patron. It's in French, so you know a patron. And and he asked in, asked me, in my opinion, was it was it talking about a, a thing they were hammering down over, or a thing they were checking against? And I I thought probably the latter, but but I you know couldn't know. You know my guess is that. You know, these guys were making van braces, and when they were done, they had to, like, fit this model, and then, then they could go on to the polishers. I mean, this is real mass production. This is, like, big, big orders. So probably the same kind of things for helmets, although no doubt if you made the same, the same damn bassinet just day after day, you'd be really good at it. You know, then they'd be pretty similar just, like, time and time again. I mean, this is a thing where, you know, we modern armorers, we, we have to be jacks of all trades. You know, we have to make everything from Corinthian helmets to Kabuto, and we never, we never really get to get to let them sink in. And um, you know, if you did it all the time, you'd get you'd get good at it and get fast at it. But surely I digress, right? Excuse me. Anybody else? I'm mostly using homogeneous thickness, mostly, because um, of where I'm putting the seam lines. And also, it's, I mean, mostly homogeneous thickness. What gauge do you use? Um, those, those helmets were both 75 thousandths, 1050 steel. And, you know, I haven't, I haven't had enough of those out sort of in the hurly-burly to see how well they hold up as a, as a, as a heat-treated piece. You know, I, I might I might end up falling back to to eighty thousands or eighty five thousands, but you know, we we'll just we we'll have to. I got to get some out there and see how they do. Someone else. Can you help by getting those helmets out there for testing? <laughs> <laughs> really, really, that's kind. That's very kind. Yeah. Do you need a barboot or a bassinet? <laughs> bassinet. That bassinet could be made to fit you. It's a, it's a little, it fell a little shy here, and I'd, I'd feel better about like squish, squishing the forehead in than pushing the sides out. So it may, it may end up a smaller size than it started. Yeah. How design orientated do you think the original armors were in the context of the period and style and, and art? And you know, were they? I guess, you know, how are you seeing or do you feel from your perspective on it that there's something where they were really kind of pushing envelopes and things like that or where they kind of had a base model and then, you know, the, the more elaborate armors or these... I, I would expect that the guys who are making making most helmets in the Middle Ages just, you know, they knew their job. Their, their job was to make you know, to make a salad that one size fit most, you know, in, in three sizes or something, so they cover almost everybody, and uh, they weren't doing much innovation at all. I, I suppose it was the big names who were the movers and shakers in innovation who shoved, shoved style along one way and another, you know, they, or they look at the shop down the way, they, you know, they're making their helmets a little bit rounder, and it looks kind of cool, you know, and next thing you know, everybody's making their helmets a little bit rounder. As, as we see, like, the, the late 15th century, these helmets just start getting rounder, and by the 16th, they like light bulbs, you know, they're, they're just immensely round. So, you know, these things drift and, and change as, you know, in response to the, the zeitgeist, you know. They, they just feel the, feel the tenor of the times and, and, and styles change. Um, I don't think there's anybody in charge of, like, 
you know, designating styles. And I don't think that individual armors are thinking so much about style. It's just like they're making what they make, and they look at it, well, you know, it'd be kind of cool if, you know, and everybody likes it or they don't like it. And I mean, this business where I'm, like, drawing everything out and trying to understand the shape, it's because I'm, I'm a foreigner, you know. It, it, this is hundreds of years ago. You know, I'm, I'm trying to understand something. I wasn't there and, and can never really understand it, but I'm trying. You know, they were there. They understood it in that way that how would you explain, you know, ridiculous fashions of today or your youth or whatever to a space alien? You know, how would you explain bell bottoms to a space alien? How would you explain, you know, those, those hip-hop hip pants with the crotches down to their knees? I can't, I can't explain that to anybody, let alone somebody who, you know. So, I mean, we're, we're locked into our, we're locked into our, our culture, and, uh, you know, to tap into somebody else's culture is a lot of work. The Germans, the Germans are. The Ger well, did they, why did they, uh, did the Germans stay with that clothing, or did they go, did they revert back to more 14th century? Style? I think to a large extent they, they just like kept their good old floating, floating joints. I, I don't think there's much, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that they like adopted one and then went back to something different. I think they just, you know, they stuck with what they liked and what worked. And in truth it works, you know. It does work. Yeah. Incidentally, the the so the so-called Italian Italian articulated elbows. You know, I mean, Blair wants to call them. Ita the first place that I've found them is in English effigies. It seems like the English may have been the movers and the shakers, really. You know, the English themselves want to think that they're conservative fellows, but I, I think that in the 14th century they were they were one of the movers and shakers in armor design. You know, the, that these innovations show up in their in their brasses before they show up in in, in a lot of things in the continent. So, you know, hey, but who knows? It was a long time ago, and, and you know, our record is spotty. Question. Yeah. When you're in battle, how could you tell who the enemy was? Was that the difference in, in the style of the I don't know. <laughs> it was my job to put helmets on them. <laughs> I don't care. I think I think not really. I mean, I think there's some kind of field cognizance, you know, banners and and colors and so forth, you know, rather than rather than armor shapes. I mean, only when you get a real clash of cultures, like, like, you know, Islam. like like Islam, yeah. You know, when you've got the Turks beating on the doors of Vienna, you can tell who's friend and who's foe by 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 the style of their armor. But if, but if you know, if you just got some European fighting some other European, it's everything's going to look the same. Well, some of these changes are going to be are going to be due to function, and some of them are going to be due to style, like, like anything else, you know. I mean, like changes in the shape of your auto body. Not much of it is function there; most of it is style, you know. So long as it functions as an auto body, and likewise, so long as it functions as a helmet. Now, if you get a change in something of the nature of the warfare, you know, if suddenly, you know, suddenly, uh, uh, let's say mounted lance mounted lance combat starts to go to fall out of fashion. Now suddenly we see bigger eye slits, you know. Um, so you do get you do get the predominant weapons weapons issues driving style to some extent, but to some extent style just drives itself because people always want to look cool, and you know well you know their cool is not necessarily our cool, but their cool was their cool and they loved it and you know it's what I mean like like I was saying those those very wide you know, early, early 1500s, early 16th century armets. It was just massively wide. They're nine inches wide and nine inches. They're just as round as light bulbs. Why? Well, look good. That's all. Just look good. Can't explain it. Look good. You know, why, why the tail fins on those, uh, on those late 50s cars? Well, aerodynamics. Aerodynamics, my ass. It looked good. You know, that's all. They said aerodynamics, but it wasn't. It was just look good. Fashion. Fashion's important. There's, there's certainly, I mean, the tonelet per se certainly tends in, t in some cases to mimic 
uh, a fashionable a fashionable garment. Um, but the idea of wearing a deep skirt, you know, goes back before the thing which is formally formally called a tonelet. I mean, tonelet qua tonelet, you know, it's kind of a 16th century idea, and it looks like these battle skirts, you know, these pleated these pleated skirts. Uh, but of course, you get deep skirts, you know, in the in in the the, the the 1430s, you know, was the great age of deep skirts. You know, 1400 skirt comes down to the hip joints. 1430, it comes down three inches lower. You know, maybe four inches lower. God knows, you know, how they moved, but they did. I mean, it comes down long enough that your legs are like smacking it when you walk. Uh, you know, <coughs> but that that's what that's what they did. You know, they wanted they wanted because be, before that, you know, your your plate stopped. Your skirts stopped here, and your your cuisse stopped here, and you just had mail in between, and that's kind of nasty. So you know, you drop a couple more lames there, and add some tassets, and you know, now you now you're moving. Uh, but then later they say, well, let's shrink those skirts and make the tassets longer, and we're still okay. You know, function or fashion? I don't know. I mean, to some extent, that's going to be more. To some extent, that's linked to saddle styles and riding styles, because that that long skirt either requires a saddle where you're standing, basically. Or it requires a skirt which conveniently collapses, and even at that, it's got to be a kind of a tall, narrow saddle. Um, and when they started to ride less in this long-legged style and, and more in 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 what the the Spaniards call a la genete, the the the, the, the Turkish style or the Moorish style, you know, with with a, a more modern seat and more flexed knees, the skirts got shorter and the tassets got longer compensatorily. And these changes don't necessarily occur in the same. At the same time, you know, the Italians seem to adopt that style before before the English, for example. You know, the English seem to be riding tall saddles and long skirts to 1450, and the Italians had given it up in the 30s or the 20s, maybe. So, you know, regional differences based on riding styles and what they're trying to do, and I don't even know, you know. But it's time it's time we go like this. Okay, thank you, folks.